Hello, uh, thank you for having me here. Thanks to Dan for inviting me to SUAX International Community Forum. My name is Marcus Springer, and uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about my home. We'll start off with a little question here for you. Which country has the ninth largest economy, the 40th largest land size, 26% of people speak Spanish as a native language, it has oceans, it has swamps, which in Japanese is Numa, it has pine forests, just like Japan, mountains, and deserts. There are alligators and puma, which we call mountain lions, but there are no monkeys. The answer is Texas. Now, Texas is not a country. Okay, so I cheated. Uh, it once was, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of it and give you a view of the culture and uh, what you can experience if you visit the, the state. To begin with, it, Texas is about twice the size of Japan. You can see right here on the map. Uh, it covers quite a bit of it. Size-wise, Texas is 678,000 square kilometers, while Japan is 377,000 square kilometers. So it takes a long time to travel from one side to the other. Uh, it's a one-day drive by car to go across the state. And it's not surprising that we have many different um, types of environment as far as like the mountains and the deserts and the swamps. And swamp is Numa in Japanese, um, just because of the size. However, Japan has a lot more people than Texas. In fact, it has about four or five times more people than Texas. So as a result, we have a lot of land, just beautiful countryside to enjoy. And that also means that we have more land for our houses and uh, for comfort any kind of quality of living that we really want to have. As I mentioned earlier, a uh, large percentage of the people speak Spanish. So if you look at the ethnicity here, the race of people, 43% uh, of Texans are Hispanic, mainly meaning Mexican, while 39% are white. Uh, and that's going to change by the year 2030, where it'll be 52% Hispanic, 29% white. Uh, the African-American population is about 11% and then 12% in 2030. Um, that number is a little bit misleading because it really depends on which city you're in. And as I talk about the history of Texas and the development, you'll see why. The languages that you'll hear, as I said earlier, Spanish is the main one, but inside Texas, you can also hear Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, African languages, Tagalog from, from the Philippines, Hindi, French, Urdu, and German. And in fact, there are about 5,000 people who speak German in their homes that were not born in Germany. Uh, and that is part of our history. Now, food. Japanese love food, so this is always a good topic. Our food culture starts with Mexican Spanish. Um, there's a lot of seafood, tacos, burritos. Uh, the food tends to be salty and spicy. From our German heritage, we get the beef and the sausage. And from Louisiana, or the Cajun culture, um, we get a lot of spicy food. And Louisiana is right next to Texas, and we share a lot of heritage because of that. Shrimp is also very popular with the Cajun food. Now, this is a restaurant from my hometown called La Fonda. And one of the things you can expect when you go to a Mexican restaurant in my hometown is that the chips are all you can eat. The salsa was definitely made at the restaurant. It's the, it will be their own personal uh, recipe. And they'll also make tortillas at the restaurant. Here you can see a pyramid of food. Um, this is kind of a joke, but you can see that sausage and uh, barbecue are really a foundation of our food. 
Uh, you can go up a little bit, we have our Mexican, and then a little bit higher steaks and fruits, and then our junk food is at the top of the pyramid. And as, as I mentioned, barbecue is really our gourmet. Um, my father has a, a barbecue outside and he barbecues at least once a week. And we make these giant steaks and ribs and hamburgers or whatever. And they just taste so much better when it's made in the barbecue pit. Texas gourmet tends to be sweet, spicy, thick, and juicy, and uh, finger licking good. Go. And it's not bad manners to do that. That's, that's a compliment to the chef. I mentioned that we have the ninth largest uh, economy in the world, and that puts us between Italy and Brazil. Now, we're not the biggest in the United States. Actually, California is, and California comes in somewhere right before the United Kingdom, between Germany and the UK. Some of our major industries are agriculture. Um, we have 16 million cows, cattle, uh, sheep, goats, cotton, which you use to make your shirts, cereal, rice. Uh, the rice is grown around Houston, which the climate is very similar to Japan's. Uh, watermelon, grapefruit, cantaloupe are big. Peaches and grapes recently, uh, we're, we're getting more grape farms, grape vineyards for our uh, wine industry. Space and aeronautics is also big. Uh, NASA mission control is in Houston. And then in San Antonio, we have uh, a research center uh, that, in fact, there's some Japanese people who are working in there studying um, space and physics. Defense and military is huge. My hometown, the Air Force, when I was a student, we had four Air Force bases in one city and uh, one Army base in my city. So it, it's called Military Town USA. Uh, but across Texas, there are many, many more bases. It, it's very common. You expect everybody to have family in the military. And if you've moved around a lot, people will say, oh, you're Air Force, right? I've lived in 20 different houses, over 20 different houses, and I'm not military, but it, it's pretty common for people to move every few years. Another industry is the computer technology and information systems. Uh, so Dell was uh, a Texas company. Hewlett Packard's also a Texas company. We're seeing a lot of the companies in California moving to Texas, which is a cause for the current boom in our population growth. Um, we're going through a, a big, big growth, which means that um, things are getting more expensive than they were. Uh, my house, for example, I, I have a property in Texas and the value of the property has doubled in the past 12 years since I moved to Japan just because the population is growing quickly and the need for houses is growing. We have a big energy industry, so oil is humongous in the West. We also have a lot of the wind panels and solar panels, um, wind farms, I'm sorry, and solar panels in Texas. The, the climate is very good for this. So uh, we can provide all of our own energy. We don't really need to import from other places. And then tourism is huge. Uh, now I've put two photographs from San Antonio, my, my hometown. This is the Alamo, and it's the site of a very famous battle, a war that took place between Texas and Mexico. Um, this is our river walk, which is just uh, a river that has a lot of restaurants and bars and uh, clubs along it. And then um, some of our rural sites are just really amazing. It, it's far away. I've never been here, to be honest with you. But uh, there's just some really amazing sites to see if you have the time and a car to drive there. Healthcare is another major industry. This is the, this is entire area here is just one health center. <laughs> uh, it's enormous. 
San Antonio's one of our biggest, my hometown is San Antonio. One of our biggest industries is healthcare, but Houston also has a very big healthcare industry. And then we have Toyota in San Antonio also building trucks. We have about 10,000 Japanese living in Texas right now. Uh, so we do have a decent Japanese population, but more likely you will see Koreans and Chinese if you visit the state. Now, I mentioned earlier that, uh, talking about the land size, so this is a middle income house and it's about 85 or 1,000 square meters and in San Antonio. And this house is here in, in Hamamatsu and it's 36 to 440 square meters. The price is the same. So if you move to Texas, you could have a swimming pool, a jacuzzi, a basketball court, two living rooms, two dining rooms, a bathroom in every bedroom, and it would cost the same as an average Japanese house. Texas is a very beautiful place. Now, normally when Japanese think of Texas, they think about this area over here, which is desert. Um, I've never seen, well, I, I really haven't seen much of this. For me, I'm from central Texas right here, which is green. And then Houston, Texas over here, which has pine forests and swamps. So what you see where, where I live is this, the blue bonnets and the clear waters and the, the piney uh, wetlands. There's a lot of fun to be had in Texas too. Uh, if you're just traveling for vacation, we have SeaWorld, which has the sea life, as well as roller coasters, uh, Japanese called jet coasters, Six Flags, which is just a, a roller coaster amusement park, uh, horseback riding beaches, uh, pretty much anything you want to do, you can do. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of Texas. How did this state come to be? Uh, we'll get into some of the events and the cultures that created it. And to begin with, I'd like to look at the big picture of the United States. There are really 11 distinct, unique cultures uh, in the United States. And you can kind of see them here. New France, which is up here, Quebec area, and down here in New Orleans. Deep South, this is where the slavery was. Uh, the Greater Appalachians, the Midlands, Far West, not much out here. Um, El Norte, this is Mexico down here, so the north part of Mexico. And then the left coast, you know, the, the far west part of California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, each of these colored areas have a unique culture, a unique background that affects them. So here in Texas, we're affected by one, two, three, four, and actually almost five different unique cultures. It's very difficult to say this is a Texas accent, or this is how Texans think. This is how Texans be, behave, because there is no one way. We, we have four or five different ways. So the history of Texas, uh, looking at the North American map here in around 19, or 1750, the yellowish area here is, was controlled by England, uh, the UK. The green part was controlled by France. The beige part down here was controlled by Spain. So Texas was really Spain mostly and a little bit of France uh, at, in the beginning. And the gray area really wasn't controlled by anywhere, anybody. And to be clear, nobody lived here in 1750. It was empty. It was Native Americans, but no Europeans. So to say it's controlled by these people is a little misleading. It was controlled by Native Americans, but uh, the Europeans claimed this land. By 1778, the French were pretty much gone. 
And so Spanish had taken over this part of the land. The English took over most of the east side. And so it was evenly divided between the two countries. By 1820, you see that the United States had separated from England and we have Canada up here, which is still part of England. The United States took over about half of North America, uh, in the central part of North America. This area is still not really developed, and this area is still Spain. In around 1820, Mexico fought for independence from Spain, and so it became a separate country. So now Texas is part of Mexico and we can see the United States is surrounding them. This connection right here, this border between Mexico or and Spain and the United States caused a lot of worry for the Spanish and the Mexicans. Uh, they worried that the Americans would come in or the English would come in and take over. The culture was very different from theirs. The religion was different. So they tried to bring in people who were more similar to themselves to move onto the land. And in doing so, they recruited French and Germans to come out here. However, however there were a couple of uh, Texans who did recruit from the, the Deep South to have uh, some of the Anglo-Americans or the English Americans come here and set up uh, farms and they brought their slavery to this part of uh, Texas. Now I just brought up slavery because I wanted to show when slavery was banned. This is not really accurate but it gives you an idea. Uh, so 1865 was when slavery was banned when it was stopped in the southern part of the, of the United States. Um, earlier than that, you know, we have it stopping in you know, 1846, 1787, 1777 in the northern part. England got rid of it in 1772, but they didn't really force the other countries very strongly to stop. Um, however, you can see Spain right down here is 1837, and they really wanted to get rid of slavery in Mexico and uh, their territories, which is why they didn't really trust the Americans. Um, and rightfully, they should not have trusted them, uh, as we'll see soon. Uh, notice, by the way, that Germany got rid of slavery much, much earlier, and France got rid of it much, much earlier. Okay, so here we go. Um, Mexico said, okay, no more slavery, and they were a new country. A lot of the people who lived in Mexico were not happy with the new government, so there was a lot of civil wars. Texas was part of that, uh, and they broke off and fought against Mexico, and they won. So in 1836, Texas became independent. And then 1846, not 48, Texas joined the United States. And um, they kept their slavery. And again, I'm going to talk about this because that's not the full picture. You can see right here, uh, this area is developed by the Americans. But over on this side, it's not really developed by Americans. It's still more connected to the Spanish background as well as the German and the French. Okay, so at that time we had a wars going off in Europe. Uh, the French and the German revolutions were happening and people wanted to escape. They wanted their independence. They wanted freedom and the, the Germans and the French had money. So they as a result, they, they began to move to Texas and populating the state. They brought their cultures, their languages. So as a result, if you were in my hometown, San Antonio, you had an equal chance of hearing Spanish, German, or French on any day, just walking down the street. Two of the main 
folks who were bringing the French and the Germans to Texas were Prince Carl and Henri Castro. Uh, Prince Carl of Germany uh, had his, I don't know how to say this, Adelsverein, and they created a society for the protection of German immigrants in Texas. Uh, their goal was to bring the high status Germans to Texas and create a new Germany. Um, people who were very highly educated, who had money and were successful. And so Prince Carl visited Texas. He wrote some letters back home and they became very popular. So many Germans began to move. And there were some other movements as well to bring the, the Germans to Texas. Um, some of the people moved into the, the farmlands and were not successful because they were high class folks that didn't have farming experience. Uh, but some were starting their own businesses and became very, very successful. And then Henry Castro, or Henri Castro, brought both French and German settlers, uh, as well as people from Sweden and uh, the Netherlands and all over the German part of Europe. Also around that time was the Irish potato famine. And um, that potato famine happened all over Europe, but it hit the, the Irish the hardest. The Irish were very, very poor. Uh, the English really were pushing them down. They couldn't buy land. They couldn't participate in government. They couldn't get an education. And they just wanted to escape. And when the potato famine happened, the, the food went bad. Uh, I think it was like a million I Irish people died. It was just a really, really high number. So in order to survive, they moved to America. And a large group moved to Texas. Uh, Massachusetts, Boston is more known for the Irish. But a lot of them moved to my hometown, San Antonio. Again, they were poor, so they couldn't get land. They couldn't become farmers but they could work in the cities. So if you visit my city, it's pretty common to go downtown and hear somebody playing bagpipes. Everybody's very proud of their Irish history. Going back, um, you can see here 1858, okay, and we have the United States, the blue parts developed, California is now developed. Uh, this area is still not developed. Um, Mexico and America still have a little bit of conflict over the border. Mexico is not very happy about losing Texas. Um, and then we got to the Civil War, the North and the South. Texas joined the South. Um, our leader, Sam Houston, did not want to join. He did not agree with the revolution, but um, he was forced out of his office and the new leader took Texas to join the war. Um, about 25% of the Texans did not want to join the war and 75% did. A large part of that that didn't were the Germans and the French who did not believe in, in slavery, uh, as well as the Spanish who, you know, Mexicans. So, Earlier I, I showed you there was this area right over here that was gray. That was the American or Anglo-English American part of Texas. And over here we have the Spanish, French, German part of Texas. And you could see that difference in who wanted to join the war and who didn't based on their background. Okay. Coming back to that picture we had earlier with the different cultures of Texas, um, you can see the settlement uh, down here compared to it. So the Spanish area right here, uh, most of these people have Mexican ancestry right here, El Norte. So most of these people are connected to Mexico somehow. Uh, right here, the purple area, these are the Germanic people who created villages and they're right in this area uh, north of San Antonio. San Antonio is this black dot right here. Houston's this black dot. So my city, San Antonio, is very, very much German, very much Spanish. 
and French. Okay, and so now you can see some of the buildings in the area that um, these are new buildings, but they're designed to look like old Germany. Uh, and that's that pride that we have in our German background. Um, this is in Fredericksburg. It's one of the old German cities, as are these pictures. And an old German church, uh, St. Mary's, I, I don't know what it's called in German, but um, they brought their their religion as well. It's an old Catholic church. Okay, and here you can see the people enjoying their beer, good German style, wearing German hats, uh, just really enjoying the culture. Okay, Wilkommen, you can read German in some of the streets that are historically German areas. And um, some of our amusement parks like Schlitterbahn, this is a water park, uh, considered the number one water park in the United States. Uh, Schlitter means slide, Bahn road. So uh, it's just uh, a German themed water park. And then you have your, your breweries if you want um, local crafted beer wineries and vineyards. These are all in Central Texas in the Hill Country region. Um, that German guy I mentioned earlier, when he when he wrote back home to Germany, he told the um, his friends that Texas was very much like Sicily in Italy. Uh, I'm not sure how true that is, but right now it is very popular for growing uh, vineyards and wine. Uh, when I was a kid, it was peaches that were no, this area was known for, but it's becoming uh, a very expensive, high-class area for people who like their alcohol. And you can see some houses in the old German village of in San Antonio. This village is called King William. It used to be called Kaiser Wilhelm, but uh, after World War One, German was banned, so they translated it to English and, and um, kept the meaning, but uh, these houses were built by the German settlers in San Antonio. And you can take a tour of these houses, by the way. I, I used to work here as a uh, tour guide. As I mentioned earlier, um, if you come to San Antonio, you, you're probably going to see Irish culture as well. On St. Patrick's Day, we dye our river green everybody wears green, you'll hear bagpipes, you'll see Irish dance, and uh, everybody just enjoys a, a good festival. And then these are some of the old Spanish missions that you can see if you're driving around in the San Antonio area. Okay, politics, um, we just had our election with Trump and Biden, Biden won. Trump won Texas. But if you look at the big cities, El Paso, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, Dallas, all of these cities went to Biden. And these are large cities. Houston has three or four million people in the area. San Antonio has about two million people in the area. You know, Dallas has, uh, I think, 1.5 million to two million people in the area. So it's a lot of people who chose Biden. And then the rural areas, the Inaka, that's where people chose Trump. Probably very soon, Texas will become a blue state. Uh, it was almost happened this time. I am expecting it to happen again. Um, earlier, I mentioned that many people are moving to Texas for the computer industry, and they're coming from California and also people are coming from New York, and both are blue states, so we can't expect Texas to become more and more blue in the near future. One thing I'm really proud of with San Antonio is the culture of giving and tolerance. Um, a, a good example of this is Raul Jimenez, this gentleman right here, who felt that it's very important on Thanksgiving Day to be with friends and family. 
Um, however, there are many uh, people who cannot be with friends or family, such as the military. Uh, young people who are 18, 22 years old come to San Antonio to be trained for the Air Force, and they can't uh, be with their family because of that. Old people whose children have moved away and they're left alone, homeless people. So he, he got his friends, uh, some local businesses and volunteers to provide a dinner for these folks. And this was decades ago and his family has been doing this since. Today they have about 5,000 people volunteer to feed 20,000 people and it's all free. Everything is done out of the goodness of their heart. It's all volunteer and free. Another example of that would be our um, Martin Luther King Day March. Now this is not something about giving, but it is about tolerance. San Antonio has the largest march in the United States, and that's significant because we don't have a large black population. Uh, the black population may be 6% or 8% of San Antonio, but 300,000 people will show up to march to honor Martin Luther King and civil rights. Uh, of course, you know, they're doing this for the Mexican population, for equality of all minorities, but um, it, it's something that's very special when you think that hundreds of thousands of people go to do this and probably one out of six to maybe one out of ten people are participating in the city. That's giant. Another example of the culture of um, giving, in this case also corporate citizenship, um, when there was the big Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans, when that happened, there a lot of flooding, flooding is Kozui, um, the people could not go home. So we opened up the city and our, our military bases to let people come and sleep. My boss specifically said, Marcus, I want you to volunteer. And my boss told all staff, you must volunteer at least two hours to help. And this happened at um, businesses across the city where the companies told their employees, you must help. The flooding was in another state, state, and it was eight hours away. Um, if you can imagine during the Tohoku earthquake, if all of the companies here in Hamamatsu told their employees, I want you to go up to the Tohoku area and volunteer, uh, or I want you to host the, the refugees who escaped the, the uh, tsunami and the disaster, um, help them. That, that's pretty much what happened in, in my city. Now, we have a lot of festivals. As I mentioned, a lot of cultures have affected us, and you'll see that in our festivals. There's festivals almost every month. Uh, the German uh, Worst Fest Festival or Oktoberfest. We have Fiesta, uh, our Spanish festivals. We have the Asian Folk Life Festival and you know St. Patrick's Day where we dye the river green and you have the bagpipes playing, the dancers. Now Texas is not perfect and one of the biggest prob problems that you can see quickly is poverty. Um, and to be clear, poverty is not homelessness. This is different, okay? Um, it's not unemployment either. You know, our unemployment rate before COVID happened was 3.4%. Poverty is hinkon. How many people cannot make enough money to feed themselves and survive comfortably? Um, and our, our rate of poverty in Texas is 13.7%. That's pretty bad. Um, Japan is actually over 15% according to the OECD. So, it's worse, but to me, the problem in Texas feels worse, and it's more obvious. Uh, you have people coming up and asking you for money on the streets, and that's a little bit scary to be in that situation. 
seeing the house is in really bad condition. Um, but normally we don't see the poor because the rich people live in rich areas. The poor people live in poor areas. So they're ignored and the situation gets worse. Some issues that are connected to poverty, one is that 22% uh, of students cannot graduate from high school. That is enormous. Um, teenage parents, three out of 100 girls get pregnant by age 20. Adult diabetes is also connected to poverty. Okay, we can learn a lot from Japan about that. And, you know, again, Japan has a higher poverty rate, but the effects are not as severe. And I, I don't know why, but here's a possibility. Um, I think Japanese have a very proactive lifestyle compared to the Texas reactive lifestyle. The Japanese think about their diets, they think about education, uh, they think about how to save money, and that leads to easier life when you're dealing with hardship compared to people who have the problem and then try to figure out what to do. Okay. I love Texas. It's a wonderful place to live. It's beautiful. It's fun. It's friendly, but it's not perfect. Um, I chose to live in Japan. My wife and daughter would like to live in Texas instead. My wife is Japanese. Um, there are certainly some points of Texas that are much better than Japan. There are certainly some points of Japan that are better than Texas. And it's just finding a good match. Uh, I'm very comfortable here in Japan. And um, maybe someday I'll go back to Texas. It, it really depends on my wife and my daughter. But uh, if I do, I, I know I will be home. If it's in Hamamatsu, I'm home. If I'm in San Antonio, I'm home. Either way, I'm going to be happy. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, as long as COVID doesn't get in the way, I'll be online answering questions. Uh, hopefully that won't be a problem. Uh, good luck. Please take care of yourselves, folks. Um, wash your hands. Um, I, I loved my time at Bungirai, and I, I hope everybody stays healthy and happy. Have a great day. Goodbye.